Welcome to Start Writing. I'm Joe Bandoski. This is an update episode uh, for those of you. Uh, this was our original release. This is the very first podcast Jay and I did. In fact, uh, I actually refer to him as Travis throughout the whole episode. That's how old it is. We had yet to get a handle on my <laughs> reference to him by his author name. I wanted to release this uh, just because uh, I've had a few discussions this last week with a couple authors about certain genres preferring a certain POV. And as we've discussed this, I thought that made for a really good uh, episode. Not uh, not to say that uh, it's, it's better or worse for one genre or not, but what we'll be looking at is the emotional drive behind a genre choice initially. And that will kind of roll back into the POV choices that go into that. So this is, in our, in our original episode, we discussed the pros and cons of choosing different points of views to tell a story, what you gain with each and what you lose, and how the type of story you want to tell will negotiate that. And as we, as we prepare and release this on episode, we'll look at the kind of emotions that you can really focus and develop depending on how you choose to tell that story. So I did want to re-release this in preparation for that episode that we're, we're, we're still researching and writing. And also, uh, I wanted to clean up the audio just because this is such an old episode. And you, you can probably hear it in my voice. I've had the flu all week long, so we couldn't get any recording done um, this week, which is why we don't have a new episode for you. So there's several reasons for, for re-releasing this to clean up the audio, to get you ready for the uh, emotional genre episode and then uh, of course to uh to release this episode back out to the listeners um uh, until the podcast is uh, a little bit bigger we are we're we're not expanding the the uh, the list held by uh, a lot of these suppliers to 20 uh just cuz that significantly jumps up our our monthly cost to to run the podcast so for now this is just how you get old episodes unless you go to podbean uh for those with keywords we do have a, an updated list that will be coming out tomorrow you do not get a, an email on these we only send out the one newsletter once a month probably going to be smaller list than you than usual just because again i have been sick in bed all week long uh so here is the episode uh i hope you enjoy it travis is jay uh just uh at the time i was very used to calling him travis so point of view here we go uh this is our first uh podcast so we may stumble a little bit um our focus here is uh point of view um, we will try to cite quotes as often as our po- as possible from various authors that you might be familiar with um, but ideally we'll talk a lot about film because a lot for for most people we see the same movies but don't necessarily read the same books books are just a wider genre they're exceptions the harry potters and whatnot. But for the most part, we, we will discuss film as often as possible. But we will read quotes from writers. Um, we'll tend to stick to classics and bestsellers so that people you're familiar with. And with that, uh, the overview for this podcast, uh, we'll talk about first, uh, third person, third omniscient, seg- second person, uh, writing in the present tense. Um, we'll talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each t- uh, style. Um, we'll look at common pitfalls of excessive POV and accidental POV switches. We'll talk about the type of narrator, honest versus unreliable. We'll talk about various presentations, in-groups versus out-groups. Then uh, presentation to, to the audience, whether it's presenting as a first telling, a retelling, or present telling. Um, so we'll look at all those different styles as they, as they impact the POV ride. With that, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, get started here. First, first person, uh, most people are pretty familiar with this. It's written in the I style, and uh, you probably learned that in eighth grade. But we are going to talk about why you would choose to write in that style. Uh, so one of the big strengths of the first person narrative is the fact that it is written in I. That is the way most of us see the world. And so a lot of times what happens when we're reading that first person narrative is we stop seeing the protagonist, and in our minds, we become the protagonist. This is a huge advantage, particularly in connecting the reader to the protagonist. Uh, One of the big things you you learn about writing is that readers don't read books where they either don't like or don't connect to the protagonist. We don't hang out with people we don't like, and if we don't like your protagonist, we're not going to hang out with them for hours and hours as we read through your book. 
using that first person narrative addresses this issue. The example I like best for this is Katniss Everdeen in The Hunger Games. If you look at Katniss directly, she is a tough person to like. She is selfish and she is mean and often cruel to everyone except her family. And it's hard to like her. But because the story is told in that first person narrative, oftentimes we stop seeing Katniss and we become the participant in the Hunger Games ourselves. And so it's less of an issue that we like her because we get to go on this adventure as ourselves. And that's one of the huge strengths of uh, that, that first person narrative. Well, let me just chime in here. That in the first person narrative, you as a reader are thinking verbatim the thoughts of that narrator. And, I mean, you can have a third person limited that, that gets you pretty in the head, but it's not verbatim. It's not word for word. And there's just a real power to having a first person narrative uh, like that. I know that uh, Travis has written at least two books in that first person narrative. What is the reason you chose that style? For me, I'm a third person limited diehard. Like that is my style. But you chose the first person narrative. So I love that how the uh, the reader is forced to think verbatim the thoughts. But it's also helpful to me as a writer that it forces me to get into the character's head like just so deeply that I have to be thinking those thoughts in order to put them on paper. And I just, I mean, I'm huge on character, and I just love the way that it forces you to really focus on character heavily. So, yeah, I, I definitely can see that from the writing standpoint, how it, it forces you to really dig in, particularly into that, that single protagonist. But uh, with, with with each style, there, there are its drawbacks. Um, I think uh, one of the big big fundamental issues with, with first person narrative is in, in writing we have what's called dramatic irony. It is when the reader knows something that uh, the protagonist does not. And again, like I said, we're going to talk about film a lot. And as we talk about film, the one we'll probably talk about more than anything else is Star Wars A New Hope. So if you haven't seen it, there are a lot of spoilers coming and I highly recommend you check it out before going through our podcast because we will talk about it a lot. If we look at Star Wars as though it was a novel as opposed to a film, um, if it had been written in first-person narrative, Luke Skywalker would never know that Alderaan was destroyed by the Death Star. He wouldn't know that the Death Star was even capable of that level of destruction until the very end of because the book. Because he wasn't there. He wasn't around when it happened, and he would have no way to know. Yeah. The only, the only indication... Luke and Obi-Wan have about what happened on Alderaan is Obi-Wan gets a bad feeling. That's it. That's it. That is all they know until the briefing at the rebel base right before they attack the Death Star. Which means if Luke was your narrator, you as an audience would never know what the Death Star was capable of either. Either, And that's a problem because the end of the movie is about destroying the Death Star. And if we don't know what it's capable of, that if, if we, we don't, don't care. know how bad it is, yeah. then it doesn't even matter. Yeah, if we don't know how bad the Death Star is, then we don't care. And you give that up. That that sense of dramatic irony is lost in the first-person narrative because anything that happens in the novel happens because the protagonist knows it. Now, Travis, in one of his novels, actually addressed this issue very uniquely, and, and I kind of like the way he approached this problem because he was able to write in the first-person narrative and still have dramatic irony. So why don't you tell okay, us how so I had this exact problem. Uh, the, the novel's called X Dot, and it's uh, it's narrated by this grade schooler named Nate. And uh, because of the nature of the story, it's it's about him unraveling this mystery. And he doesn't encounter the antagonist, the bad guy, until over halfway through the book. And it was problematic for readers to to wait so long to really know the danger that he was involved. In. Like. Like how close he was to dying, like literally. He's very close to dying, but he doesn't realize it, and you're losing tons of that drama because of that. So what, how I solved this problem is I actually added in a second narrator. It is a first-person narrator. He, he, the character's name is x -Dot. He's like this android kind of ghost creature. Um, and he narrates these little, much shorter chapters that are interspersed between Nate's and his perspective allows you to see the bad guy and, and you know what the bad guy is capable of. So you can worry for Nate even more than Nate is worrying for himself. And I think it works pretty well. It's, so, it's your help. 
as I, as, I, as I talked to Travis about this, a few of the things he did in, in, in styling this is one, he made sure the chapter heading was very clear to the reader. And two, he, instead of writing in the standard past tense to, that most novels are written in, for those chapters for X Scott, those very few, he switched to a complete present tense and he really changed the styling and the vocabulary as well so not only were you told this was a different first person narration but it felt like you were dealing with an entirely different narrator as as you experienced that and i think that was both very very important decisions in approaching that dramatic irony issue in, in the first person style i think it was some good choices on his part thank you so one of the examples uh, we, we've talked about as well is, is the way that that, uh, that that dramatic irony can completely change a story. So if we take a story about a, uh, a, a, a hopeless romantic sensitive guy, and we <laughs> we we throw him in with this very attractive con artist. If we tell this story from the first person perspective, it reads like a romance until the very end when she rips him off because we don't see her perspective; we only see his. But if you flip that same story into third person limited or third omniscient and we get to see her head and scenes with her plotting and planning that don't involve him, immediately we read the scene of their very first meeting. They're out there. They're flirting. It no longer looks like a meet cute of a romance as they're flirting. We can see she has no genuine feeling for him. She is manipulating him so that she can rip him off. It is an entirely different story. And now you as a reader can worry about this as you're watching it because you know what's going on. And, and hopefully you have some some sympathy for the guy, and so it, so you worry. There's it it adds a ton of drama to happen. So so and, and it is this idea of dramatic irony that that makes me the diehard third limited person that I am. Mm -hmm. But like I said, there have been very successful and very well written novels done in that first person styling. And like I said, there is a strength to it that you don't get anywhere else as far as that character connection. Uh, excessive POV uh, is, is another issue we're going to address here, and that is overwriting the point of view. This is where you're basically just writing extra words that, one, race, waste the reader's time, and two, can annoy the reader. And uh, in, in writing the first person, uh, a lot of times this is done in writing I. I saw, I felt, I thought. Uh, after about a page or two of just drowning in eyes with every paragraph and every third sentence starting with I, the reader wants to pull their hair out, right? It's maddening. And the the thing about this is that in our own heads, even though we see the world in kind of that first person POV, we, you know, as I, we don't even think that ourselves. We don't think I feel angry. You know, we, we, we don't think I see a red shirt. It's just a red shirt. And so... So you, you don't write, man, I think she is beautiful. You write, she, man, she is beautiful. beautiful. You skip the I think. Like just leave the I out of it and yeah. go straight to the And thought. so I often refer to this as, as writing in the existent narrative as opposed to the first person because things just are that way, right? And that's how you would write them. The, the mountains, you know, were covered in snow. I don't say I saw snow-covered mountains. I just say that they are covered. So and this brings us to uh, to the next one, which is seems versus is. And so a lot of times, both in the third person and in the first person narrative, to to make it clear to the audience that you're not changing POVs, you're not jumping into another person's head, that they're not reading a third omniscient. A lot of times, if the character is having thoughts about another person, right, that, you know, I, you know, I think Travis is angry, you know, you don't write Travis is angry, but rather Travis seemed angry. So it puts in this perspective there that these are my thoughts on him because I'm not actually in his head. I don't know his exact feelings. I don't know his exact thoughts, but I speculate on them. And so that's that seem versus is. However, there are some exceptions to this. Travis has, has talked about uh, in dealing with unreliable narrators and overconfident narrators. Yeah, so <clears throat> I think that you can get away with a narrator who who is so cocky about his perspective that he thinks anything that he perceives must be fact rather than a perhaps. Anyway, so I, I think you can get away with stating things and just saying this is how it is as long as your narrator is that sort of person that, that isn't very humble and isn't willing to say concede that another perspective might be true that isn't his own. So, and an example here from uh, from my novel is, if if I were to to violate the POV, say Stevenson's eyes moved rapidly as though taking in everything in the train station. Use the as though as that speculative, right? 
because Stevenson's not the POV character. I use that. But if you take that out, Stevenson's eyes move rapidly, taking in everything in the train station. I violate the POV. But then Travis makes a point that you can have a, a you know, if you establish the quality of the character up front, just super confident, then you can get away with that. And that kind of brings in not, not just the overconfident narrator, but the unreliable narrator, which he used in, in his most recent book, The Song of Locke. Song of Locke is the story of a kid named Locke. He's, you know, this young, teenaged adventurer. This is a fantasy world. Um, the book is narrated by his uh, compadre, who's, I mean, think of Peter Pan and Tinkerbell. The book would be narrated by Tinkerbell, only in this case, Pick is a, is a male. He's a sylph. But, it, but it's his companion that's narrating the story. And uh, he says things as if they're fact, as, as he sees them. And Locke will interrupt him and say, you know what, that's not true because of this. Or, well, what about this? And, or he'll even just tell him, hey, shut up. Like, so it, it adds another perspective so that you can see that even though Pick thinks that his thoughts are the end-all, be-all, there are other perspectives out there. And so it, it adds, it uh, cues the reader in so that he knows Take this with a grain of salt. Uh, exactly. Yeah, I think uh, the, the, probably the most famous example of the unreliable narrator is uh, Catcher in the Rye. It's it's a much more subtle approach to to illustrating that the uh, narrator is unreliable. There are just little hints here and there where where he words things funny or he makes odd statements about things to kind of cue you in. Whereas I actually prefer Travis's style because it's very clear up front that pick the narrator is twisting things to fit his own ends. You know, he tends to over-dramatize, and, like, uh, they share some kind of special link between the two of them, and Pick assumes that he knows exactly what's going on in Locke's head and in his dreams and, and all that, and Locke makes it very clear that he's often wrong. Yeah, so, yeah. even though they have that link, it's, 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 there's a subtle thing to it, and, you know, Pick is just, he tends to really manipulate his perspective on the world and, and assume that he's objective when he is intentionally not. So, um, you have anything else to add? No, I don't. I don't okay. Guess. All right. Let's, let's go ahead and go into third limited. So the, the really best example of third limited out there is, uh, the game of Thrones series by George R. R. Martin. Very popular. So good. And, uh, it, it, if you haven't read it, it is a fantastic read, but each chapter has a character name is the title, and that tells you who the POV character is. And so you know whose head you're in. And with the third limited, most people cut it by chapter, but sometimes you can cut it by scene. But each scene or chapter, you stay in one person's head. So again, you're going to need to use that speculatively, as though, and the seams to fill in perspectives of other people. But one of the real strengths of the third person limited is that we get multiple perspectives on thing. I, I have a friend, and whenever he has a crush on a girl, he thinks that everything she does is amazing and relates to these positive traits that they have. She's just incredible for that first week when he's really into her. And the reader has to take the narrative as, as close to objective as possible, right? But as we shift out of that first person into a third person narrative, then you have the option to demonstrate to the reader that that perspective may be flawed and that it is an individual's perspective. You know, my, you know, writing, writing a novel involving my roommate, we could have his POV chapter where he talks about how awesome he is and the things she does and how it demonstrates that. And then you could have her best friend get irritated and agitated at these same qualities as she does these same things. She sees a very different a trait associated and the interesting thing is she would even have a, have a better knowledge of this young woman than my roommate who just met her and, and fallen for her getting that that third person limited we get multiple specters of things we already talked about you know you have that huge edge in the dramatic irony there in in, in building tension that way and i think uh one of the really interesting things is is, is that it's, this is true both of both of the third limited and the first person is we get to see the world through a character's eyes it's a quote from my book uh where uh, in this scene it reads and you are he continued in his best polite voice despite the fact that she smelled like cheap airline food swirled with cheaper perfume now because this is is uh, is a third limited and 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 the pov character is costly these are not objective facts about the world that she smelled like cheap airline food and 
she was wearing cheap perfume. Rather, these are his perspectives that she's cheap, right? And so that comes through in that third person limited. Whereas with a third third omniscient, because we're moving from head to head, we have to assume that the narrative itself is objective as presented by the author. And so that's a big difference between those two stylings is, you know, we get more of a character bleeding through in that third limited because we recognize that everything is not objective, but rather everything is tainted by the perspective of the POV character. So and can I just throw in here, I, I recently just read Dune. Dune has a more omniscient and he'll switch, you'll see the thoughts of two characters that are having a discussion just like right next to each other. And I think it, it really makes it hard to get into a single character's head and to really understand them in a, like a deep and meaningful way. Third Person Limited really has an advantage, I think, on characterization that, that in most ways is like just as good as uh, first person narration. Some of the weaknesses uh, of the Third Person Limited, sometimes the reader doesn't connect with all, all of the POV characters. Brandon Sanderson is an author that I love, but when I was reading his his Way of the Kings books, he has a character named Shalon who I just don't like. Every time I got to a Shalon chapter, I wanted to skip it and jump back to my favorite character, Kaladin. And you know, I mean, I was okay with the Dalinar chapters; I didn't mind him, but I wanted to skip Shalon. I didn't connect with her, and that's gonna, you know, that's a, that's a risk you take any time you start to have multiple POV. You know, we we may not like those characters as much. We may want to skip those chapters. Travis and I, we even talked about the fact that, uh, you know, he asked me, he says, if Shallan was the only character in Way of Kings, would you have read it? And I said, as much as I read, love Brandon Sanderson, I wouldn't. <laughs> I would not have read that book. And honestly, I feel like it's the same with uh, the Game of Thrones series. Um, if you took out all my favorite perspectives and left like whatever half of the book is left. Um, I just, I don't think I would like it. I mean, I would like it a little, but not a lot. Right. Yeah. Way of Kings. I think the first book is over a thousand pages and the second's even longer. When dealing with a narrative of that length, it's harder for a reader to connect each of the perspectives and the chapters to to the plot of the character they like. You know, the same thing happens in the Game of Thrones. But a lot of novels that are done in third limited, they're not as vast and expansive, and so it's it's easier for the reader to make the connection. How does this plot connect to the protagonist that I'm following? And I think as long as you're able to make that connection every time, if the reader can always see that connection, it's a lot easier that for them to get through the chapters of the characters they don't like as much. If you if you read The Way of Kings, like I said, it's vast, and it is a long time before the plot lines of Shallan and Kaladin intersect, and f- for hundreds of pages, you don't see how these two are connecting. You know they will eventually, but without that connection, it just is harder to invest in those characters you don't like as much. Man, I think that's a really good tip that I would like to apply as a right. That- just make sure that the different narratives are really intertwined so that they're pointing toward each other and making you excited about each other and you know weave them early in the book rather than waiting for them to collide at the end. That, yeah. That's definitely something I'd like to try to do. The next weakness we want to address is what I call splitting the story. For someone who plots out everything and they're working towards, you know, the, there's certain points and everything, this is less than an issue. This is more of an issue that pansters and get into, and that is with multiple uh, POVs, sometimes they end up kind of splitting into their own stories. If you read Vanity Fair, that's something that definitely happens. You know, you have the second protagonist, Amelia Sedley, her story divides hers is kind of dull and uninteresting and yet and so you have all these chapters that a lot of people end up just skipping by the time they're halfway through the book because they they never really come back around the story splits into two stories and one of them is less interesting and so that's another risk you have in that in that third limited with multiple perspectives end up it's chasing a second story that doesn't fit in with the first one and and it takes that 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 problem we discussed a, a minute ago of not liking one of the protagonists and not caring for their chapters and, and just amplifies it because now it's not even connecting back to the story it kind of makes me think that some of these secondary uh povs that are not as popular with readers maybe they're really important to the author but i feel like certainly they got feedback in early drafts as an author, I just want to be aware that if I'm loving the perspective but my readers aren't, I, I really need to just 
you know, murder your darlings, as they say, and just at least trim the chapters way down uh, so that this isn't an issue as you're switching back and forth. Yeah, yeah, I think that's actually a really good point. I remember specifically reading The Way of Kings, and the minute a Shalon chapter started, I, I flipped and, and counted the pages, like how many pages to Kaladin? I went through and I counted every time, like, all right, 15 pages, okay, 20 pages, then I get back to it, you know, <laughs> because I was just count, I was just counting them down, trying to get there as quick as I could. You know, so I think that that's a really good point, particularly getting that beta feedback that, uh, hey, we're not liking this character as much. I'm skimming through. Look at if was this one of your darlings that should die off? And if not, can you trim it back, make yeah. things a little briefer and, and indulge less? The excessive POV, the overriding of the of the point of view here is somewhat similar. Um, in, a, another negative point, another thing to watch out for. Yeah, this is something to watch out for uh, is, is saturating the narrative with he thought or David thought um, or David saw fairly similar here. And so what happens is uh, we have in writing a styled structure that tells the reader a lot about what's going on. So once you have established your point of view character, if you write a, a line in italics, we know that that is the verbatim thoughts of the POV character and no one else because you're in the third limited and it tells us that. So tagging that with he thought doesn't add anything except wasting a few extra words for the reader to, to look at. And uh, no, now there is an exception to that, and that is audio. Because the, read, the, the listener cannot see what's in quotes to make dialogue. He cannot see what's in italics to be verbatim thoughts. It's harder for them to sort through this at times. And so for me, the text of, uh, of, a, of a reading versus a text for the audiobook is slightly different because I do have to go in and tag some of these things. Now, a great audio reader can clarify this for the reader, but just through manipulating their voice. But there's no guarantee you're going to have a great reader who's going to do this for you. And so I, I do prep two versions of the manuscript to adjust for this. Yeah, I think that's important. Personally, I probably get through more audiobooks than I do regular books. And yeah, I think it's an important consideration because it is a huge market. Yeah, particularly because I, I, I've noticed as, as I've gone through my books that as you read things aloud, like without without those those visual cues, sometimes a line of, uh, of of thought can read like a line of dialogue. So like, for example, if the guy thinks, go to hell, maybe he doesn't say that, right? But you read that line, go to hell, and then all of a sudden the other guy doesn't react to it. And it's like, wait, what happened? He just told him to go to hell. So so it's important that you know you, you tag those in preparation for the audio or, or you have a reader who can make that clarification because otherwise it can get confusing for a reader. You know, as much as I, I tried to prep my, my manuscript for an audio read, uh, there were a few points where readers still got confused and be like, whoa, all of a sudden he didn't react to this. And he should have been like, oh, well, that's because he thought it. He didn't say that. <laughs> An important consideration. So in writing, writing just a text manuscript, you'll want to look at the he thoughts, he saws, he felt, because the POV establishes that, right? If there's a feeling going on, we know it belongs to the POV character. If there's a thought going on, we know it belongs to that. If you switch POVs during, you know, you break your, your rules there, you can confuse the heck out of a reader. But uh, as long as you stay true to your POV, you can drop all of that and let the structure tell the, tell, tell the reader. How, uh, what what all of those are connected to. Um, and that kind of brings us into the third omniscient. And this is perhaps the biggest reason I, I warn people off third omniscient is because your your manuscript does become slightly saturated with Alex thought, David thought, Mary thought, yeah. because it's really hard to tag what thoughts belong to who when you jump into everybody's head. Now, on that same note, I do not think I have ever read a truly third omniscient manuscript. Usually what I end up reading is third limited with the option to jump into someone's head at a moment. Because usually what it, what happens is we stay in one person's head for an entire scene and every only once or twice will we jump out. So, yeah, I just... Dune is an example of like true omniscient where there will be three characters having a conversation and you go into the heads of all three of them in rapid succession, which honestly is kind of jarring for me. I don't really love that style, but it's been done and Dune is very successful. So whatever that's. So I, I, I really enjoyed Dune. I'll add that in there as much as I, I, I don't recommend the style because the, the manuscript gets weighed down with a lot of extra writing, but it has to be there. 
not only are we writing who thought what, but when dealing with you know any, any kind of murder mystery style, what a character observes becomes an issue as well. So you've got to be add into Alex saw, David saw, and then we know who saw what, who's got what information. So again, it really bogs down a manuscript and makes it really quite bloated. And there are there are different ways. We'll talk about action beats and how you how you use action beats to tag dialogue instead of just using tags. And a similar technique can be used in the third omniscient, but again, those are tools that rely on the visual structure of writing that don't carry over to the audio version of the manuscript. So even in prepping that audio manuscript, it gets a little bloated with that kind of tagging. But we'll talk about some of the strengths here. Uh, <laughs> now that we've, we, we went a little reverse order here. Um, one of the, uh, the, the, the big strengths is that you can be in everybody's head. The way I like to think about this is imagine being on a date and not only knowing what you're thinking, but knowing what the other person is thinking. Like it just opens the door wide open. And really every every action can be analyzed further. But not only that, but you get just so so much insight on, on how people react totally different. But it gives you a different way of looking at character. And so we talked about dramatic irony at the beginning. In this narrative perspective you can just you can leverage that to your advantage so much like so anything that could be dramatic you can bring up and make it be dramatic yeah like you don't even have to wait for a new scene right we have our two characters out on a date he does something and then we can immediately jump into her head and she'll be like oh he's weird is he a serial killer we can get that thought immediately we don't have to wait for the next scene right we can have all of that laid out like you said you can leverage dramatic irony to the hilt in a third person omniscient and uh, sometimes uh, not always but uh, people will even add in the uh, author as a, as a as a perspective within that Which third, I think is really fun. third third person narrative you know like the classic line little did they know right that is none of the characters knew that so this is actually the author now becoming a perspective within the text as well and that really is only a style you can take in with uh, with the third omniscient. I have a quote here from Agatha Christie's, and then there were none, I believe, previously titled Ten Little Indians. So here it is, uh, just on page seven. In a non-smoking carriage, Mrs. Emily Bent sat very upright as were her custom. She was 65 and did not approve of lounging. Now, Emily Bent knows how she is, but the way the perspective is presented, we recognize that this is not... Emily Blunt's thinking this. This is not her perspective, right? This is very much the author zooming the camera in in a style that is very clear that we're seeing things from the author's view at this moment. And it kind of depends on how you approach writing. I think I see this as both a strength and a weakness, is that when you're writing in the third omniscient, we assume that the narrative is objective. You don't have the luxury of the unreliable narrator because the characters aren't the narrator. You, the author, are. And I suppose it's possible to have an unreliable omniscient narrator, but it would be kind of weird and confusing because it would be hard for any character to clue the reader in on that. So it, it basically becomes not an option anymore. Uh, another drawback is we can know the characters of the thoughts, the, the characters, of, the thoughts of all the characters, but we don't get to see the world the way they see the world. Uh, going back to that line I'd read from my book about the cheap airline food and the cheap perfume, that line doesn't make sense outside of the third person POV. We don't see that, that tainted coloring that each character takes on to the world in that third omniscient because again, the, the, the narrative for the most part is the author as opposed yeah. to the characters seeing those things. And so one of the really potent stylings is, uh, of the third limited, again, I kind of, I kind of boast this up because <laughs> it's my preferred style is, is as you write each chapter in the POV, you focus in on how that person sees the world. If you've got a, a stoner who's just chasing girls, then that's what he notices in the scene. He notices the shady guys who he can buy some drugs off of, and he notices the attractive women he can hit on, and he notices how much they're drinking. Whereas opposed to you put a spy in that same scene, he notices who might be packing a weapon, and he notices who's edgy and hypervigilant for a relaxed atmosphere. He sees the scene entirely differently. And that is one of the beautiful colorings and, and variations you get in that third limited as you shift from one character to another. Not only do we get in different people's heads, but you see the world entirely different based on that person's priorities and values. Just 
something I love there. So Travis uh, initially thought my my book was the third omniscient, <laughs> and uh, to which I said no. <laughs> and why, why don't you talk about some of what happened there? <laughs> um, just as I was reading, I didn't understand that some of the asides, well, I assumed that some of the asides were from various characters and not always the same character in the same chapter. Now, granted, this happened largely because I was listening to an audio recording rather than the original, and, and so I couldn't see where necessarily the italics were placed and the arrangement of the paragraphs, but I got a little lost. So, yeah, the, the big thing that happened is that uh, there are a few places in the book where I change POV from a scene shift as opposed to just a chapter shift, which uh, which threw him and, and, and another reader off a little bit. Again, we're dealing with an audio versus a visual issue here because the reader sees the scene breaks page breaks but the listener does not tagging that for the listener is rather a tricky issue uh, which I, I honestly am still sorting out uh, on how to approach that problem with audio we'd love to hear from you on your, your suggestions on how to, how to approach that problem or how you've dealt with it in your own writing as well this has gone a little. Second person. Oh. Yeah, I was gonna say we've gone a little longer than we planned, um, but we are getting near the end, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, finish off here. Second person. This is a style probably not a lot of people are that familiar with, and this is the perspective you. Let me give you a line here from a novel written in in the you perspective. This is Bright Lights, Big City. This is the opening line. You are not the kind of guy who would be at a place like this at this time of the morning. The entire novel is written that way instead of i instead of eric or david or he it's you one of the uh things that it does is it makes the reader a character in the novel it's a very avant-garde approach a lot of people do not like to read in that second perspective uh if you had an english teacher and you wrote in a second <laughs> second person perspective they corrected you and told you not to do that and one of the reasons is is that it it puts assumptions on other people in that you style they're telling you how you acted, what kind of person you are, when you might not fit that. And so that can be a little grating for a reader because they're like, I'm not that way, but they're actually referring to a fictional you. And yeah. intellectually, it's a little difficult for us to process that way. It doesn't feel quite like we're watching a movie. It is a very different style. Like I said, it's very avant-garde. I don't recommend it, but it has been done it Goodreads has an entire section. You can type it in second person, and that, they'll give you a whole list of books written in this style. To um, me, it seems like an experimental type thing. And I mean, there have been novels written this way, but I can't imagine myself ever doing anything other than maybe a very, very short piece that dabbled with this strange perspective. Yeah, yeah. We are not overly familiar with it, uh, so we, we can't explore in depth some of the strengths and weaknesses of the style. But, uh, you know, if you're really curious, you can pick up a book, check it out. I, I couldn't get more than a page in before I, <laughs> I wanted to throw the thing across the room. Um, but uh, uh, a few other uh, side issues uh, we mentioned in, in our overview here. One of the things we're going to talk about is present tense. As, as you're probably all familiar, most novels are written in past tense, right? We call it, it, it's the past that is the present, right? It's kind of as it's happening, but we write it in past tense. As to why that is specifically, I don't know. Somewhere that became the standard, and that's how we do it. But, but at least in English, like that's what we're used to. That's what makes sense, I feel like. Yeah. Uh, you have some examples like The Hunger Games, which honestly, it's written in present tense, which drove me a little nuts. Uh, I don't love it. Although ironically, those chapters that are narrated by X dot that I mentioned earlier in the podcast, those are actually in present tense. But just to excuse myself a little bit, these are very short chapters. They're like three paragraphs long. And I feel like you can get away with that present more easily. Such an unconventional thing is easy to do when you keep it short, keep it sweet. We kind of looked at this uh, uh, to kind of examine some of the strengths. One of the real strengths is that when, when a story is written in past tense, it's assumed that the protagonist survived. We kind of take off the death of the protagonist uh, 
from the table, and that removes a certain degree of the tension within the novel. And you know, very possibly that's why uh, why the Hunger Games was written in first person is to add the fact that you don't know if Katniss is going to survive. We're just going through this as she is. On the flip side of that, there are some definite weaknesses that come out. One is if you go off into a big chunk of interiority in the middle of an action-packed scene. It feels out of place. It's like if this is all happening around you right now, that's not what you're thinking, right? You're not going to go into that in-depth of a thought process. And this actually happens several times within the Hunger Games. And it just feels off because everything's happening right now. The, the POV violations that we look at here are, again, interiority that's possessing knowledge beyond the immediate moment. Uh, here's a line from the Hunger Games. I stick to the road out of habit, but it's a bad choice. But... How would she know it's a bad choice without foreknowledge of what's going to happen on that road? Again, that's a POV violation that's easy to encounter when writing in that present tense because we can't have any knowledge about the future. So again, there's issues in delving into the interiority and very, very tricky issues with, with not dumping up foreknowledge. In, in, into the character's heads by writing in that present tense. But again, you know, we have the Hunger Games. It is a life and death story, and we have this added tension that because the story is being told as it happens, we don't know if the protagonist survives. That's not inferred by the addition of ED to words. Just a few other bits and pieces here to deal with POV. In groups versus out groups. This is this is a, a more in depth approach to to the styling of your of your books as you're treating the reader how how do you view this as as an in, as an insider to the to to the world and events or or more of an as outsider so if you're looking at any kind of a military thing if we say get patched up at the med tent or picked up by the MPs in an in group approach we don't explain what med tent is we don't explain what MPs are we assume that the reader either already knows or they'll get it from context. We're treating the reader as though they are part of the group, part of the know of the details of this world. Uh, whereas outgroups assume that you know nothing and explain everything to you. If you've ever read Tom Clancy, this is what he does. Let me let me read you a section here. This is from uh, Teeth of the Tiger, and this is just the, the opening of the book. David Greengold had been born in that most American of communities, Brooklyn. But as his bar mitzvah, something important, but at his bar mitzvah, something important had changed in his life. After proclaiming, today I am a man, he'd gone to the celebration party and met some family members who'd flown in from Israel. Here's our first point of exposition. His family flew in from Israel. His uncle, Moses, was a very prosperous dealer in diamonds there. Exposition point two. David's own father had several retail jewelry stores the flagship of which was on 14th Street in Manhattan. So again, here's our third point of exposition. While his father and uncle talked business over California wine, David ended up with his first cousin, Daniel. His elder by 10 years, exposition point four. Daniel had just begun work for the Mossad, Israel's main foreign intelligence agency. Exposition point six. You know, within two paragraphs, you know, we've got six dumps of uh, exposition on you. Clancy assumes you barely know how the world works at all. He treats you as a very much an outsider who needs to be filled in on all the tiny little details of what's going on. Now, we're going to talk about Hemingway and his approach to this, but also in, as we go into Hemingway, we're going to be looking at the first telling of a story versus the retelling versus the present story telling. So treating your, your your reader as though they've read this story once before or it's the very first time they've heard this story or even treating them as though they're not reading a book, treating them as though they're sitting there with you and they can even see some of the landscape around them or maybe they've been part of that. And so this is uh, this is coming from Hemingway's A Farewell to Arms and uh, we have this quote here. In the late summer of that year, we lived in a house. We looked across the river to the plain and those mountains. And so here, he doesn't tell us what year it was. He doesn't tell you it was 1850 or, or 1912 or anything like that. He does not tell you what year it is. He says that year, as though you know. It almost feels like he's he's talking about events you're familiar with. It's It's almost a retelling. He says, we lived in a house. We looked across the river doesn't tell you what river. He assumes you know what river 
to the plane in those mountains. Those mountains, it's almost like you're sitting there next to many points to them, right? Those mountains. Yeah, that's sweet. <laughs> you know, and again, even even here we have in the late summer of that year, we lived in a house. He is making you one of the characters in the story. You were there with me. You know all of this because we lived there together. It's a it's a very different approach. It, it is one of the reasons why Hemingway is a master to look at at all the possibilities in, in point of view and to choose that one. So, so I actually faced this issue in Song of Locke. I had some readers um, that wanted to know more about the world. Like I did a lot of world building that it's very subtle and like to really discover the, all the intricacies of the world you got to look very carefully but honestly that wasn't a I didn't feel like it was key to the story to really know all the specifics and to really get nerdy I, I just felt like it didn't matter so I kind of in that story at least I tended toward the Hemingway side where I just kind of assume you know and just keep going mm. uh, a lot of uh, a lot of authors approach to this in group out group issue is to bring in a character who does not belong to the in-group, someone who's freshly joined the military or just arrived to a new place in the world. And then there's a reason for the exposition. You know, The exposition is then moved into dialogue as things are explained to the character because their questions come up. So that's that's another, you know, kind of a, a blended issue here. You can take that farewell to arms Hemingway approach where you're skimming through, but then you've got someone specifically asking questions and being confused by all of this in-group knowledge. It's, it's just another way of presenting that to the reader. Uh, we've got a few uh, tips here on, on exo- avoiding the excessive POV, you know, constantly tagging characters. One of the things here you can do is uh, giving characters traits and referring to them, you know, color of their hair, you can call them the redhead or just shorten. And a lot of times what authors will do, particularly in dealing with smaller characters, when you introduce a, a character who will only be present for the chapter, particularly if you don't know their name, identify them first by a trait, nasally voice. Then it drops down to the, no- the nasal va- voiced man, then it drops down to nasal voice, and then you know by the third or fourth reference, it's just nasal. He's he's got a name that is actually a reference to a trait, based on based on the point of view there. But you can do that for for bigger characters as well, hair color, eye color, marks, birthmarks, things like that are way to refer to your characters without drowning out the reader with the eyes and the name and names and different things. Just a way to avoid that excessive POV. Uh, nicknames for characters, slings nicknames around pretty wildly. It's a way to change that constant referencing there. Ticks, habits of behaviors. If you have a character who wears glasses and is constantly pushing them up, you may not have to tag that thing with anything other than you give the action beat. He pushed up his glasses. I don't tell you the character's name, gender, or any of the, those tags that are usually used because that beat tells you that this person does it. We've used it often enough early on when their name was still being thrown around. Instead of even using any kind of tag reference, we just use an action beat that that character alone uses. Catchphrases uh, are another one that we see to, to identify characters. I dated a girl who liked to say indeed a lot. <laughs> By throwing that line of dialogue in there, you can identify the speaker of a line of dialogue without flagging them directly with a tag. Accents and dialects, those are tricky. We'll, we'll actually go very in-depth into that at another time. And then uh, the writing structure uh, of action beats and one one actor per paragraph. We will explain that much further in depth when we talk about beats. It's a structural rule to identify who's speaking and, and whatnot without, again, drowning the reader out with name references. There is something in writing called writing true. And this is not about writing the truth, but rather about writing in a way about something that if anyone is familiar with it, they will agree with you that that's exactly how it is. And if it's something they haven't experienced as they think about it, that that's exactly how they would imagine it to be. And this is what we call writing true. It's a way of, of writing in a way that just really breathes a lot of life into it. It's incredibly difficult and demanding. And one of the things I like to do as I read is, is I hunt for these moments where the line or the description or whatever is just dead on it is it is true in the sense that it's exactly how i would imagine it to be
So each we each time we, we publish, we'd like to, to throw one of these lines at you guys, see what you think, and hear back from you. You know, some of the lines you've read that you just thought were just fantastic and just really brought something to life. This comes from Stephanie Myers, not the writer of Twilight, but <laughs> but but another author. Um, and uh, so this is actually a, a manuscript in progress. But this line I, I read in her manuscript, it was just fantastic. It's a story about a, a grandpa and his two grandsons. And uh, there's a moment where he's inviting them to go make popcorns. And he, this is the line he uses. He says, let's pop us up some corn. Mm-hmm. And when I read that line, I thought that's perfect because it, it, it feels older. Instead of saying make popcorn, he says, pop us up some corn. And it just felt perfect for grandpa to say that. It really just connected me with his age and, and the generation he'd grown up with. And uh, I... For me, that was that was a, a, a great moment of writing true. All right. Thanks for listening. As always, uh, we would love it if you would leave us a review on whatever platform you listen to. Uh, tell your writer friends about it. If there's a particular episode you really enjoy, we would really appreciate it if you'd share that uh, on whatever social media you use, whether that be Twitter or Facebook, just to help us, us uh, reach more people with the the show and uh, have a bigger audience there uh right now uh some of the episodes we're looking for we're we're developing right now i mentioned we're doing one on emotional genres and we're also working on doing one on patreon i've reached out to several authors who've uh, agreed to interviews but i thought i'd mention it here uh It's not something we have a lot of experience in, Jay or I, using Patreon. So we're just trying to gather a lot of interviews just so that we have a better understanding of it before we we present the research that we have. Because any research we're presenting is all going to be secondhand. We just don't have enough time to put together this episode and invest months into using the platform and trying it out. So most of it's going to be, you know, secondhand uh, uh, exploration. Uh, of the platform so if you if you have knowledge and you you'd want to come on the show and talk about it we we would love to to uh, discuss some of the ups and downs of using patreon and the things that haven't haven't worked uh if you want to sign up for the newsletter you can do that at joseph com slash start dash writing and uh that is the official uh uh home of the podcast it's just a sub sub part of my author page there uh again that is bendoski that's b e n d o s k i dot com uh we're going to be trying to do a lot in the next week to clean up the website i got a great email from del de silva with a lot of recommendations i'd hope to put them in this week but as before i have just been so sick the whole week but yeah so if you want to sign up for the newsletter there uh, you can do that and get access to the keywords. The initial keywords are all free, and then anyone who has the uh, the newsletter has access to the all the updates that we are releasing on those keywords. There's also a tutorial video on the page to walk you through uh, setting up your Amazon ads and how quick and easy it is to just copy paste those keywords over into your ads to to start generating more impressions and, and clicks and sales. Uh, and uh, that's it.